for, for most of the attendees. Um, as I've mentioned, my name is Neil Madhika. I'm the CEO, co-founder of 1.3 Biotech. I think he went through most of the background, so I uh, really don't need to say too much, but, um, you know, um, excited to jump into things. And um, like I said, excited to spend some time on questions. You know, I won't use the full 40 minutes, so hopefully we can have a full discussion at the end um, and we'll go from there. So, um, cool. I'm assuming everyone can see my screen. If someone can't, if we can't, just, you know, someone. Yeah, so much, yeah cool. That's so good now. Awesome. Great, guys. So, um, as I mentioned, right, um, you know, I'm the founder, I want to see of 1.3 Biotech. And what I wanted to talk today about was kind of how we think about 1.3's uh, approach to drug discovery, particularly focused on target discovery. Now, I am, what, the fifth speaker of the day. So I'm assuming by now everyone here has probably heard like a hundred times how hard drug discovery is. That seems like an appropriate, fair assumption. I, I'm sure you've seen these numbers over and over today. I'm sure you've seen them in hopefully in textbooks now, but obviously you guys know drug discovery in the earlier stages are dramatically different. Now our kind of ethos at 1.3 is there's tons of reasons that drive this failure, but we're kind of of the, the worldview that the biggest driver of this failure is just frankly that we don't actually understand biology incredibly well, right? That could mean we don't understand a disease's biology well enough. That could mean we don't understand target biology well enough to know what happens when a drug modulates a protein. And that could mean we don't understand organ or systems level biology well enough to understand how side effects happen. And this is really where one three kind of plants its flag, right? Across the myriad of problems in drug discovery, our hope is to be a biology-driven AI company and really try and decouple these biological mechanisms. Now, if you take a step back and you look at kind of the field of drug discovery, you know, my rough version of drug discovery traditionally is you have someone identifies a new target, identifies some new biology, someone then builds compound drugs, whatever therapeutic modality against that. That drug is positioned or repositioned, and then finally you design clinical trials against it. Hopefully everything goes well, you have a drug or a treatment ready for patients. Now, we've seen tons of activity in the last five, six years on these later stages, right? There's so many companies that are building amazing technologies to enable us to make better drugs, right? Design better chemistry, thinking about other therapeutic modalities. There's companies that have done, taken high throughput screening and analysis to a completely different level and enable us to find new uses for old drugs. And then finally, companies that are combining data in such a way that clinical trials are becoming much better. But we saw at 1.3 in the early days was that felt like there was a gap at that earlier stage, right? If you look at right now, there are currently over 200 different STAT3 programs out there at different pharma companies, right? If you look at KRAS, these popular targets, so many companies are working on these targets with well-established biology. But what happens to the next generation? What happens when we have a KRAS or we have a STAT3 drug? What are the next targets gonna be? And how do they, specifically when you look at more rare niche subtypes of oncology, which is where our focus, What's, how, who's going to be finding those? And that's really what we set out and built 1.3 to do. So what we've built at 1.3 is what we like to call our target discovery platform. Right? This is a multi-step AI pipeline that enables us to discover, prioritize, and de-risk new disease targets. Now, I'm not going to go through every single section of this in today's talk. Just to say each of these is kind of an entirely different algorithmic infrastructure that focuses on a problem that we think is crucial to early stage target discovery. Now, for those of you who aren't really right, like targets and drugs fail for a myriad of different reasons, right? Ranging from efficacy, right? You can hit a target and the target could have no effect on disease. And we've seen that a lot in all violence. Um, safety, right? You could hit a target, the target has an effect on disease, but the target also causes severe side effects in your know, patients and side effects that aren't tenable. Lastly, you could targets fail or programs fail because you can't find that right patient segmentation. Right? You see drugs work on some patients, but it's not really across the board and physicians and clinical trials. It's like, well, I, I can't trust it. I'm not going to do it. Targets fail because we can't make a good drug, right? We can't identify the best compound, the undruggable targets or promiscuous um, compounds out there. And then finally, targets fail for commercial reasons, right? There are a limited number of targets out there that, you know, we can't, that just aren't that novel. Or there's targets that are really only specific in a small, small subset of patients. And sometimes companies have to make difficult decisions about which ones they're going to go after. So what we did at 1.3 is over the last really kind of decade of R&D, starting at Cornell and then leading into the company, is build out these different pieces into a kind of a multi-pronged approach. 
that enables us for any given target or any different discovery program to get these kind of pieces of information and understand at a more holistic level what makes a target good and what sort of targets are going to be worthy of downstream future study. Now, for every single piece of this problem, right, as I mentioned, biology is at the forefront. We have kind of a saying at 1.3 that it doesn't matter if something works if you can't tell me why it works. So what we like to call is biological interpretability. Now, fundamentally, I think you've probably heard a bunch of talks today uh, all over the day about the different pieces of AI technology, right? Ranging from what does the engineering come from to new algorithmic methods. I thought there was a method, a talk on graph neural networks today. And I'm sure Andreas talked a little bit about kind of data quality and thinking about how, you know, thinking about where you can bring in data. And our take is that you really need both, right? And biological interpretability and accuracy are derived from both the engineering and the modeling pieces here. So at 1.3, we take kind of a, a pretty different view of data than a lot of the big players in the space. And that we think power comes not just from data quantity, but data diversity. What I mean by that is there's a lot of approaches. The classical approach for AI and bug discovery is you find your ideal data set, right? Whether it's chemical structure data, clinical data, image data, and you try and build up this massive proprietary data set and then apply AI on top of it. Now that's all well and good, but then you are always going to be left struggling with the biases of an individual data type and the lack of what one data type can capture, right? Even if you have the highest, most thorough image data set out there in the world, the chemical structure data set, there's things you're gonna miss if you're not looking at the other aspects of data out there. So what we built at 1.3, and this is what my PhD back at Cornell was really focused on, was how can you take different data types, such as chemical structures, clinical records, bioassays, genomics, CRISPR screening data, and put it all together into one platform. Now, to enable that, we at 1.3 have built out what we think is called our data engine, right? This is an automated mapping, quality control, and ingestion engine that allows us to take unstructured data from hundreds of different sources and bring it together into a single structured relational data. Right, currently, this is a little bit out data, but currently we're mining over 60 different biological, chemical, and clinical data types. Um, we just hit our 300 data source. Uh, this is growing at a rate of about 40% quarter over quarter just because of its automated nature. And this enables us to hit, on average, what we've seen about five times more data diversity than a lot of the other approaches out there. Now, what that enables us to do is build what we call precision modeling on top of it. Um, if there's one kind of caveat or advice I can give to anyone looking at AI and drug discovery is that there's never going to be a one-size-fits-all approach. Biology is far too complex for that. So you need to make sure the algorithms you're designing really represent the biological state you're trying to model, right? So we've kind of developed to date, right, hundreds of different algorithms, each focused on different pieces of biology, different data aspects, and different questions we're trying to solve. So I think the unique thing about these algorithms is they're really built to handle that diverse data input, right? We're not just throwing everything into a deep neural net, which inherently may not be built for that function, and trying to account for the biological complexity through different interpretable mechanistic outputs we're looking at here. Now, what this means is this all kind of comes together, and I'm just going to let this play with some fake data in the back, what we have to call a discovery dashboard. Um, this is really where all these different predictions come through allow us to, for a given target, get understanding of efficacy predictions, understanding toxicity predictions, um, looking at how it compares to other targets, how it compares to other chemicals, what drug ability size you have. And I think this is really what's key here, is if you think about how drug discovery is done in a traditional pharma company, you need this information, right? No program is going to move forward without some degree of information across all these different aspects. Um, and that's what makes early stages so difficult in the case of that failure rate. So our kind of core hypothesis across the board is if we can get this information from the earlier stage, we can pick those targets from day one and reduce that churn throughout the entire funnel process. And really, the way this kind of comes together is once you have that more comprehensive output, you really understand more and hopefully can increase the downstream chance of clinical success. Um, so here's an example I'm showing from one of our recent partnerships. Right? This is a partner that had an in-house AI team. Um, they had identified that a gene was relevant in breast cancer. And that was kind of where they were struggling. They're like, we know this is an interesting gene. We know we want to target it in breast cancer. And this is an ideal way for us to say, let's see if, how we can show more comprehensive biological information. It's going to increase the overall strength of the program here. So using our approach and using that panel of different methods, we were able to get this far more comprehensive output, right? Identifying the driving mechanism of that relevance, right? So that lethal relationship. Identify a patient population that was highly dependent on that gene and the somatic lethal relationship. 
therefore predict an inhibition strategy that was going to be safe and efficacious because it was very cancer cell specific and also identify kind of the binding pocket and compounds that could be used against it. Um, caveat here, um, a lot of this is kind of blinded or for lack of a better word, kind of masked data just for the sake of confidentiality, but hopefully the, the idea and the thought here comes clear. Now, I'm not gonna go through every aspect of this platform just because you know we only have about 15, 20 minutes left. But I did want to spend a little bit of time today talking about what I think is the crux of that platform, which is the first step, which is how we predict gene efficacy. Or the way we think about it is predict kind of a novel way of predicting genetic essentiality and genetic dependence. Now, just taking a step back, right? The idea of gene essentiality is if a gene is inhibited or lost, the cell that is essential or dependent on it is going to see a severe decrease in fitness. Now, in cancer, the severe decrease in fitness can be most likely measured as cell death, right? It's an idea behind a lot of CRISPR screens, the idea of SHRNA screens. If you can find those genes that cancer cell is dependent on and you drug them, theoretically, you can better understand how to treat cancer. Now, the crux of this is if you can do this at a high throughput scale, what you can really understand is you can understand cancer dependency networks in a way that previously hasn't been possible and hopefully identify new nodes or hotspots that can be drugged for specific cancers. But as any biologist in the room would know, genetic essentiality can be driven by so many different underlying variables, right? We showed an example earlier where it was being driven by synthetic lethality. Sometimes it can be driven by certain transcriptomic profiles. Sometimes it's cancer cell or cancer subtype dependent. And these are just an examples of a few. And traditionally, genetic essentiality methods have struggled trying to kind of combine all of those into one binary essential or non-essential class. So we took a slightly different approach. Right? Driving from our ethos of we need to design methods that are built for biology, what we did is we tried to break down genetic essentiality into the different biological mechanisms that contribute to it, the different data sources that measure it, and the different types of essentiality that are looked at. Taking in, like I said, this huge input diverse data set ranging from clinical data to biological data to cell data to chemical data, we built a panel of different models, each focused on predicting a different subtype of essentiality. Now, the idea here is that while each individual model is only predicting a small slice of the world, if you do this across every single gene, across every single model, for any gene, you can get an understanding of what is contributing to an essentiality prediction. Is this being predicted essential by the synthetic lethal model, the transcriptomic model, the drug transport model, et cetera? And also see where models overlap, right? This with this underlying core hypothesis that if you see a gene being predicted essential by multiple different models and a specific subtype of cancer, maybe that leads to a higher degree of confidence here. So based on these results, what we then did is we want to kind of further subset this world by looking at what really makes a good target. In addition to just essentiality, right? As I mentioned, you don't want a gene that's just essential ever. Right? If you do this analysis and you look at things such as GAF-DH, right, a key metabolic enzyme, it is going to come up as essential. Every single cell in the human body needs to use this to survive. What that means, if you use a GAF-DH drug, you're probably going to kill a bunch of normal cells in the process and have some pretty severe side effects. So what we did is we tried to convert our essentiality into what we call target scores. These are scores that are adjusted to ensure that these common essential genes are not pursued, that right? you really want to find kind of the sweet spot, right? Where you have a gene, and I'm looking at the bottom red box here, right? A gene that across all the different samples is mostly non-essential. And there's a subtype of samples where it is very, very selectively predicted as essential or predicted that the cancer subtype depends on, right? Ideally, you would see clustering in the sample subset. You would see that maybe it's fine across all normal cells, it's fine across all other cancers, but in small cell lung cancer, you're seeing most small cell lung cancer cells are highly dependent on this gene or this family of genes. That's what gives you an insight into like, what is driving that biology and where can we use that to build the program? Now to kind of help illustrate this in a bit more detail, I, we also did an internal example where we looked at every single drug that was been approved for certain targeted therapies for cancers out there that we get our data on, and we looked at comparing our predictions on genetic essentiality versus kind of classic experimental results. So ran a few high throughput CRISPR RNA screens and used some existing data out there. What we found is out of the 206 approved cancer drug pairs, right, drugs that were targeting a specific gene, if you used existing methods, right, you would have missed the, the mirrors and the signals of dependence that led to that drug being developed and ultimately led to the approval for almost 25% of those drugs, right? 53 out of 206. 
What this is telling us is that these high throughput methods are missing a lot that's out there. And realistically, this number is actually gonna be higher than expected because these are on very, very well studied cancer types. When you go to these rarer cancer subtypes, right? Like you know, mutated small cell lung cancer, cholangia sarcoma, right? Like areas like that, when you have even less data, right? It's even more important to kind of develop these new methods that are able to kind of hone in on the specific subset where you might not have hundreds of CRISPR screens or hundreds of SHRNA screens. And this made us really excited because we knew we were finding target classes that were being missed. And that's what opens the eye up, you know, opens the doors for building a platform like this to identify kind of completely radically new targets that we can develop or can be developed by a partner. Now, to help illustrate this, I kind of wanted to go through two kind of key examples, one external with a partner and then one internal as we're developing it. So here I want to talk through how we use this predicted gene essentiality to identify a new mechanism and indication for a clinical stage asset, Onc201. Now, Onc201 was developed by a company called Oncoceutics. Um, they had spent you know, millions and years of money trying to try and figure out what was the driving mechanism of this compound. And without this information, they were kind of stuck, right? They were in clinical trials, phase two clinical trials against many different cancer subtypes, seeing some pretty broad activity across the board, but ultimately had this inherent question of like, how, what is our defined patient subset? Like, what is our sweet spot? Where we have that 10X advantage? This was difficult, right? Because without the mechanism of this drug um, and without kind of clear ideas linking that mechanism to a given cancer subtype, it was how to optimally select that patient population. So using our platform, we tried to do two things here. The first kind of banning from the back end, one of our other methods, we use all the data on this compound, on this compound structure, the assay data we are getting, the clinical data we are getting, and identified that what we, the platform predicted was driving this compound's anti-cancer efficacy was actually an unknown effect on DRD2, dopamine receptor 2. This is a target that really hadn't been thought of as a cancer target before, really no data on cancer implications. But our platform was showing that if you look across the biological networks where the signal was getting most condensed was on the dopamine receptor 2 or dopamine receptor signaling pathway. So this was exciting because this what told what this told us was, hey, this compound has a target that we didn't know about, and this target could be driving that action. We still left that fundamental big question, which is, okay, now that we have a target, what are we actually going to do with it? And as I said, one of the things we're building at 1.3 is we have this constantly run an engine predicting the optimal target for a very defined patient subset. So we went back and looked at that and looked at our genus NGI model. We looked at 300 different cancer subtypes and we said, which one of these cancer subtypes is most dependent on DRD2, right? From there, the kind of the core idea was if you can find the cancer subtype that's most dependent on DRD2, then that's going to be what's most affected by onc one treatment. And therefore, the indication where ONC201 is going to show the most clinical benefit. Driving that deeper beyond just an in initial cancer subtype, we looked at specific biomarkers that correlated with DRD2 essentially predicted essentiality and found that a type of cancer that was coming up consistently was glioblastoma, but specifically glioblastoma with the H3K27 methylation mark. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is kind of a rare form of glioblastoma, brain cancer, that has a huge unmet need. Right, this is you know average life expectancy in patients is anywhere from six to nine months. There's a significant pediatric patient population. It's more aggressive, and there aren't really any drugs out there that can be used in these patients when surgery is not an option. So, using an animal model, we first validated this finding, saying, okay, we're seeing some activity in this defined patient population with this animal model, and based on this, and based on this prediction that we were predicting G H3K27 methylated glioblastoma to be heavily dependent on the DRD2 signaling pathway, we started with Oncoceutics a new clinical trial, uh, phase two clinical trial in this patient population. Um, and got the results last year with some pretty overwhelming results across the board. We saw that for many patients, life expectancy went from three to six months to many patients have been stable, disease-free for over two years. Uh, we saw effects in both the adult and pediatric patient population. Right? I'm showing here a story um, of a father of four who was given you know, months to live and is now back at work. And patients who, you know, children who really couldn't live functional lives were now back at school on continual treatment with ONC201. This was incredibly exciting for us because this is a, a finding that really wouldn't have been possible without this really focused genetic essentiality or genetic dependence predictions. One, because this is not a chance area of cancer biology where there was a lot of data. And then two, because because of the rarity of the, the, the subtype, right, you would never look at this or find this from traditional high throughput screens. 
because there's never going to be enough H3K27 methylated glioblastoma samples. And there's hundreds of other cancers like this. And of course, not only did this have a huge impact on a really important patient subset, it also had a huge impact on the commercial development of onc 201 and Oncocytics. Um, based on this finding, Oncocytics was recently acquired by Chimera um, for over $400 million in cash and other consideration. Right? And the reason they were, did that was because they saw that this defined patient population presented a huge market opportunity because here's an area where they could offer traditional, like really transformative impact and functionally actually change not only prognosis, but also life expectancy um, for these patient subsets. And this is what is incredibly exciting to us as a company, because what we know is that DRD2 and HDK instead of methylated glioblastoma are just one of many cases like that out there. And with that in mind, what we have really started to build more recently in-house is using this technology internally to create a novel pipeline of cancer targets and cancer therapeutics that we will develop assets against. So with that in mind, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the last thing, which is how we've used our internal discovery engine to identify novel cancer targets that we are now developing internal assets against. So as I mentioned, right, we've used this platform across the board to identify targets, de-risk them, and prioritize them ranks. We did this earlier this year, I'm uh, oh, sorry, last year, um, to, and, and came out with five different targets that we were really excited about, right? These are by no means the only five targets out there, but we wanted to start out with a kind of diverse cancer subset. I'm um, identified in the spirit of about a month and a half, five targets that had never been clinically tested for various cancer subtypes. And these are five targets, which for each cancer subtype, we identified a very distinct dependency pattern four distinct patient populations, right? We're revealing two of them, three of them are still under wraps right now, um, but one of them's in small cell lung cancer, one of them has activity in certain subtypes of kidney and ovarian cancer. For each of these targets, right, we had predicted all of those different aspects. So each of these have been in silico divis based on efficacy patterns, predicted safety, um, predicted, <coughs> excuse me, uh, predicted drug ability, clear patient populations, um, and because of that, we were all rapidly able to identify test compounds or existing compounds that even though they've never been clinically tested for oncology, existed, and partnered with a CRO named Crown Bio to test this anti-cancer efficacy in a defined panel of cell lines. We are already seeing that about 80% of those novel 1-3 identified targets are showing very strong signs of anti-cancer efficacy in a way that previously hasn't been reported and wouldn't have been expected. And interestingly, what we also found is that if these targets, even though they're showing kind of broad anti-cancer efficacy, come from incredibly different target classes. And this is something that was important to us, because like I said, a lot of platforms out there, what we've seen is they kind of become pigeonholed. And we really want to kind of showcase here that we're able to, by using these different mechanistic outputs, predict essentiality and dependence across multiple different target classes. So as you're seeing here, right, one of the targets is an interesting transcription factor, one's a dehydrogenase hydrolase and hydroxylases, alkyl transferases across various different, <clears throat> excuse me, cancer subtypes, which is incredibly exciting to us. Um, now, of course, as I mentioned, for two of them, we're kind of publicly revealing very distinct biomarkers and patient subsets that our platform is able to identify. And I'll just walk through a little bit about what we've seen and how, what makes us incredibly excited about those two, right? OTB 100 and OTB 200. For OTB100, what we were able to identify was that even though it was small cell lung cancer, there was a, our platform was showing that there was a clear knockout mutation, mis non missense mutation, that when that was present, our platform was saying that it's going to be much more dependent on the OTB100 target. What we found was that was exactly what we confirmed in the small subset of samples we were able to get our hands on. What we showed is that when that mutation or that biomarker was present, you see much, much stronger efficacy signals measured here by percent inhibition in a growth inhibition assay um, than when that biomarker was not present. This persisted not only across all cancer samples, but even in this defined small cell lung cancer patient subset. What this means is that from day one, we already have a patient selection strategy, right? When we go into our first animal study, we know exactly what PDX models or organoids to test. When we go into that clinical trial, we can from day one select that patient population that's going to receive that maximum benefit and optimize towards there. Right? Take a strategy similar to the Loxo oncologies of the world rather than doing this kind of larger clinical trial, which leads to cost and time inefficiencies and trying to narrow down from there. We also saw something similar in OTB200. 
By there, it wasn't an a mutation-based biomarker, but an expression pattern that our platform was shooting out that's saying that when this signaling pathway or this specific set of genes is highly expressed, you are going to see much higher overall response rates. And that's exactly what we saw, right? When we looked across these panel of in vitro samples, we saw that when that signal that we identified was highly expressed, inhibition of OTB200 had a much stronger effect on those cancer samples and a much stronger effect on the overall growth inhibition in both the ovarian and kidney cancer samples, which we're looking at here. We also saw some interest in thyroid cancer, but um, it was a little bit, some confounding factors, which I won't get into just for this, the sake of this talk right now. Um, but this was really exciting for us because it showed us that once again, we're able to identify these kind of distinct patterns of biology that are showcasing these biological interactions here between OTB200 and uh, the biomarker gene we're looking at that can lead us to design not only better patient selection strategies, but find targets that otherwise would have been completely missed. And we saw this hold out on an individual sample by sample basis here. Um, here I'm showing kind of a subset of different cell lines we tested on. Um, it's kind might be kind of hard to see over Zoom here, but the bottom curves here are the purple curves where that biomarker is present. We're seeing concerns again, much stronger growth inhibition curves than even the samples of the same exact cancer subtype when that biomarker is absent, right? And this was all found purely in silico without using any new data, right? We were able to predict these biomarkers from scratch and kind of drive that process going forward, um, which in first mess is incredibly exciting as we move forward. Um, so with that, Hopefully I finished close to time. I think we see I have a, you know, five, 10 minutes here. Um, but I you know, wanted to take a time to tell you guys a little bit about how we are thinking about the future of cancer drug discovery, focus on the earlier stages of biology and how AI can be used not to just answer these binary big picture questions, but really hone in on specific biological mechanisms that otherwise would have been completely missed. Um, and really, build a pipeline that otherwise wouldn't have been possible, right? I think we'll talk a little bit later about how AI companies are transitioning from tech first companies to biology first companies. And I think that's what makes me most excited about the industry, right? That it is possible, not just to build cool technology, but to build a pipeline that is significantly differentiated from what other technologies are out there producing, just because AI is a different technology, right? It has different pros and different cons. And if you're able to understand and leverage that, you can tap into areas of biology that otherwise would have been so with that in mind, I'll kind of close out. Um, here's some details on me, right? I'm happy to answer any questions at any time from anyone, either now or later. My email address here, our Twitter, our website, please feel free to reach out. Um, and I'll just close out. I, I know there's a lot of PhD students in the audience or post PhDs. So um, I will just close out with something from my favorite doctor and say, good luck, everyone. Cool, that's it for me. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Neil. That was a super talk and also my favorite doctor. So thank you for thank you for including that. Um, there are lots of questions in the chat about um, the data fusion and kind of the data sources you're using. And that's what I, I wanted to ask about first as well. So you're, you're bringing in, you know, 200 plus different data sets from different data sources. And so I just wanted to ask about like the origin of some of this data. So is this open source data? Um, do they come from proprietary sources? Like what is the origin for lots of this yeah. data? Yeah, so I'm gonna start off with a little bit of a controversial statement in what I think people talk about AI. I think there's way too heavy a reliance on proprietary data, right? Proprietary data is great, but like I said, Unless you have Pfizer level resources and are spending all of those resources depending on proprietary data set, your proprietary data set's always going to be a little bit lacking, right? Even I would say probably one of the best proprietary data sets out there, right? Recursion Pharma's proprietary data set on image data. I'm sure if you ask Chris or you ask Juan, like they're going to tell you that there are certain aspects of that data just won't be able to capture. So we really think that, you know, the AI company as a whole needs to probably escape from dependence on purely just dependence on proprietary data. Obviously, it can help. So our take is we really think about data fusion here, right? We're integrating data from hundreds of public open source data sets, right? Data such as the NIH, NCI, um, we're integrating data from kind of the UK Biobank and trying to think about how can we synthesize it all together. So in other words, right, I think one aspect is being the Wikipedia or Google of data, right? Taking data that is out there in some way, but is not at all being utilized and then bringing it together to something useful. Now, once we've done that, another thing you can do with data is you can figure out where the gaps in data are, right? For one of our programs, we're able to look back at the data and say, hey, you know what? We have really good data across all these different aspects, but for small cell lung cancer, if we had transcriptomic data on these five organoids, 
we predict that's going to improve performance by 15 percent right and that lets us be smarter about collecting that then we can either say we're going to go generate that data to fill in that gap or find partners like some of our pharmaceutical partners to integrate some of that data as well um so that's kind of a way out of things like we first built the foundation using public data sources that continues to grow just as public data can use to grow and then use that to fill in gaps through either partnerships where we have access to our data or our own internal data generation strategy Okay, cool. That makes a lot of sense. I was wondering about like the filling in of, of, you know, missing data and generating your own. So that makes a lot of sense. And then, so actually on like the technicalities of fusing such a lot of data sets, we have a question from Mark and he's just asking like, are there serious particular challenges you encounter in the data engineering, like a mix of cloud data? Um, how are you, how are you building your stack? Like how much of a challenge was that? Yeah, the short answer is a big one. Um, <laughs> talk about... It took about, I'd say, like two to three years. Like, we're still, the engineering is still growing. And it's been, I would say, it constantly took us about two to three years of dedicated engineering before I feel comfortable making the statements that we now have this kind of blackboard one, mostly automated data source, right? So, yeah, I think it's a huge challenge, right? Things such as mapping. Even if you look at any PhD student who's tried to combine five or 10 data sets, can tell you that the data set one will call drugs one thing, data set two will call them something else, data set three will have errors, but trying to figure out that, that is the matnib the same as Gleevec, the same as this chemical structure, quality control, right? The, you know, there is this, I hate this saying, but people use it a lot, garbage in, garbage out. I think it's kind of a lazy way of answering the question, but like, we, like there are nuances around data and you have to figure out how to handle it. Because if you throw everything in without any sort of quality control or normalization, you are gonna have that problem of nothing talking to each other. Um, and then lastly, right, I would say like that, like what is your integration strategy? Um, so for instance, we chose a relational database, right? There's a lot of different databases you could choose. I think a big, more really popular one in the last couple of years has been kind of knowledge graphs. We stayed away from that for a variety of different technical reasons, but you have to figure out what that's gonna look like. What do your data structure looks like, right? You can't just have random databases sitting. We've set up kind of like a better word, three data structures at the drug level, the target level, and we like to call the clinical or sample level, and those three data structures speak to one another. So designing that core infrastructure you're going to build on top of that's going to be able to scale is pretty important. Um, this, I think, you know, it not only pays dividends at the beginning, but also at the end, right? As you know, Charlie remember, we two days ago announced a partnership in um, using drug discovery for infectious disease um, with a public company in the UK called Fourback Pharma. What was exciting about this partnership beyond just the disease area and kind of the huge unmet need is this is the first time human challenge study data is ever going to be analyzed by AI. Challenge study data, a unique type of clinical trial data. We were happy because we didn't have to build a new data infrastructure for that, right? We had built that core infrastructure, designed it from the ground up so we could just basically say like, hey, here's how it fits into our infrastructure. And it turned what otherwise would have been a six, nine month data process into a couple of weeks of like, let's just, once we get our hands on it, we can integrate and begin AI from the get go. So that's, you know, I think I answered maybe two questions there. Hopefully I got all of them, but let me know if not. Yeah, yeah, that was that was very helpful. Um, and then, uh, you know, still still on this data sort of thing. So you, you do take in data from all these locations and presumably there's perhaps overlap between data sets and potentially discrepancies. Um, and so Elizabeth, um, sorry, Sub Subashini is asking, do you find that, you know, on your manual curation side, you have to be dealing with discrepancies between these data sets? Or is that a case of where you're just like, we need to generate some of our own data in this in this uh, this part? Yeah. I think it's, you're always going to see the preferences in data, right? And there's, there's this, the cynical way of the preferences in data, discrepancies in data. Some data might just be like flawed, very fair. But I also think like people expect data from different sources on data, different cell lines or different conditions to magically be the same. And that's not going to be the case, right? And we've seen a lot of that to date. So we think about discrepancies in data two ways, right? Like one, we have a confidence scoring threshold, right? So once you can kind of, you can always do the wisdom of the crowds approach. When you're integrating 200, now 300 different data sources, right? If there's 40 data sources that mention a drug of matinee and 38 of them agree and two of them disagree, that tells you a little bit of something about confidence, right? You can look at what drive that data. Was the two data sources that, maybe the two data sources that disagreed were clinical data sets while all the other 38 were in vitro data sets. But so you maybe want to rank those two data sources higher and take that into your confidence threshold, right? So you can get those kind of insights on data discrepancies rather than just saying it disagrees or not. And then, right, at the, at the end of all of that, you still decide, hey, we need to generate new data. At least you know what exactly you're trying to prove. 
right? And you know exactly what may or may not be driving. So the short answer is you're always going to see discrepancies in data. The ideas are how do you handle them? You're like, and rather than saying I'll either eliminate them or hope they magically disappear. Okay, perfect. Um, and then uh, both Sanjay and Elizabeth are asking you to just comment a little bit on your your thoughts on knowledge representation graphs. And so, what, you know, what actually were the technical reasons why you decided yeah. not to go for that approach? Because it's a it is a popular um, approach. Yeah, so what were your What were your reasons? I think, you know, in full transparency, I think this is a question that our lead engineer is probably going to be better at answering. But I'm going to give you kind of my take on it. Is that at the end of the day, right? When you're thinking about data sources. Uh, Knowledge representation graph, like a lot of times, you can do it one of, like I said, we want to think about the three different sections, right? We want to think about drugs, genes or targets or biology, and then the samples. And we, we found is that there's a lot, the easiest way to connect data was by first figuring out which of these three main sources was the primary asset holder and then connections across. That made more sense in a relational database, right? In a knowledge graph, you either have three separate knowledge graphs, which makes kind of computation and traversing those knowledge graphs a little bit difficult. Um, or you tried to make a structure where you know, everything was in one. Um, and just what we found is that made the knowledge graph kind of unnecessarily convoluted. Right? There were just connections that a biologist would look at this like, yes, technically this drug is this gene, which is this, but like realistically, you should just have subverted that, make this the rest connection. Um, another thing is like, depending on how you set up your knowledge graph, right, there's directionality in the graph, which may or may not be what you want. Right? Like I said, I've seen knowledge graphs used pretty successfully and you're trying to represent signaling pathways where there's inherently some directionality. I would argue that for a lot of data, you might not have directionality or you might not want to assume directionality. Um, so there are such a relational database just for a little more sense. And then finally, just compute power. Um, like I said, we use different types of algorithms right, ranging from deep learning and neural nets to force-based learning to multitask and multi-class learning. Um, across the board, you just see better performance in terms of time on relational databases and knowledge graphs, which are a little bit more optimized to one type of machine learning than another. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Um, and then one, one last question before we move to our next speaker, Daniel, um, is from Pankaj. And he just asked, could you say a little bit more about the DRD2 finding? Was that one of many for that drug? What was the key sort of input data? Do you have a way to, to look at that sort of stuff? Yeah, no, great question. So um, I'll give a short answer and then say we, we published this finding kind of Nature Communications in 2020. So happy to kind of send that along to shoot me an email, I can forward it to anyone who's interested. Um, yeah, so DRD2 finding, right? Um, was it one of many? Yeah, of course, right? Like I think at the end of the day, like I said, just like discoveries aren't binary, usually you know, you're going to get a ranked list, right? In this case, DRD2 was very much at the top of that list and had it was a clear outlier. Um, so it was, in our minds, it's like, this is clearly the standout target, but there were a couple others. And for scientific theory, we did test those as well and saw that the lower ranked hits either had very, very low target binding efficacy. So we didn't think it was driving the effect or it was you know, invalidated, which was good for us in this case. Um, in terms of which data, um, so the short answer is this, I actually really like this story because when we looked at the individual data types, if you looked at just the structure, if you look at just the efficacy data, just the transcriptomic data, clinical, bioass, et cetera, no method on its own was able to identify DRD2 as the top ranked target. It always came up in the middle. Um, we tried both our internal methods, but also worked with you know, a lot of the big structural chemistry-based approaches like SCA, some of those bigger kind of more classical ones that you've seen from the chemistry-based AI companies. And what this told us was that really in this case, right, DRD2 was seeing a weak signal across all these different data types. But when you kind of combine them together, you exponentially magnified that signal, which is what was really exciting to us. So the short answer is no individual data type contributed more than 20 to 25% of that prediction. Um, across the board, we are seeing much stronger predictions come out. I would say a data type that uh, Oncosudics was surprised to see was effective was uh, high throughput screening. I think that's a data type that we at one three are very passionate about. I think it's oftentimes a very, very underutilized data type. Um, but like I said, in this case, it only contributed kind of a little under 20% to the overall prediction. But a lot of people just assume kind of random high throughput screening is not going to contribute anything at all. So it was exciting to see that. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Neil, for your talk um, and for your answer to the questions. I think we'll hear more from you um, at the panel slightly later on. Um, but it is now my pleasure to introduce Daniel Jameson. Daniel, are you with us? I, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Fantastic. Um, so Daniel um, firstly uh, studied 
um, undergraduate in biology at Southampton. He then moved to Leeds, completing a master's in computational biology before um, moving to PhD at Manchester. And there he founded BioRelate in 2014. And his PhD was titled Text Mining and Molecular Interactions in Their Context. And Daniels continued to work in this vein somewhat BioRelate, where he has co-developed Galactic AI, which is a supercomputing platform that automatically curates biomedical research to very much improve the understanding of a particular area in drug discovery. Additionally, Daniel is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology, and we're very grateful to have you here today, Daniel. So over to you. Thanks a lot. And let me start with a very boring question. Can you see my slides? We can. Can. And if I move on to the next one, can you now see a different slide? Okay. Perfect. Perfect start. Excellent. And thanks for coming along. It's Saturday, so you must be very, very keen indeed. Um, very grateful to have you all with me. And what I'm going to be talking about is cause and effect and how we use it to empower drug discovery. Um, and I'm going to be taking two sides to this talk. One is very much an explainer, um, helping you understand some of the, the basics behind cause and effect. And the second side is all about how we can use this type of data to solve some pretty interesting drug discovery related problems. Um, so let me start off with um, a, a, essentially a slide on pirates here. Um, here you can see in this particular plot, uh, decreasing numbers of pirates against increasing global average temperatures. And, and you can see that this trend is correlated. It's correlated because these two things are not causal. causal. Um, certainly pirates is having no impact on temperature changes. And we're seeing all kinds of these, these correlative type relationships in the world. So the first thing to understand about causation is that it's not correlation and it often gets confused with cause and effect. And the kinds of things that you can get with cause and effect is that causes can first of all be proximate, the things that are more closest to, or ultimate, in that they're, they're the real reason behind um, the effect that we're, we're seeing. Um, so you might um, liken this to um, the person that shot the gun versus the country that legalized the, the use of firearms. Um, so we get different potential distances between cause and effects, um, although Every single cause and effect is directional in that causes must occur in the past. I've certainly not seen any examples where that's not been the case. And as I showed you already from this plot, correlation is not causation. It's a, it's a statistical relationship. Um, and so let me give some examples of where we might see cause and effect in the world of biomedical research and specifically uh, within literature. Um, we've got a particular example here where somebody's talking about the very popular drug metformin reducing renal cortical GRP78 expression. Um, and so we might hope that this is a cause and effect relationship in that metformin is doing something to HSPA5, um, otherwise known as GRP78, which is a, a synonym for this particular gene. Um, then we might have another piece of published research that comes along and says that GRP78 silencing reduced the clue protein. So another different cause and effect relationship in a different piece of research, um, which uh, again is a uh, clue is a, a synonym for TRPM2, which we can see from another piece of research that if you suppress TRPM2, it reduces renal fibrosis. So here we have a path between three separate pieces of research in which we can link the drug metformin to renal fibrosis. Um, so this might start to lead to some kind of insight as to how metformin might relate to particular diseases or it might impact particular diseases. Um, but of course, there are many, many different cause and relationships, cause and effect relationships, which we see within the literature. Um, and that particular path is, is one of many. Um, so what we want to do is to understand the significance of each of these pathways, and also the overall significance of any particular relationship between, say, metformin and renal fibrosis. So here in this particular plot, um, which is otherwise known as a, a Sankey plot, you can see the, the most um, specific or the most enriched paths 
between metformin and renal fibrosis. And so the way that this is calculated is that you're essentially taking each node in this subgraph and you're looking at how many connections each of these nodes has uh, against the whole of biology, so in the full graph, and then how enriched is, are the connections within this subgraph versus that full graph. And so you can do this across this whole subgraph to give you an overall significance between that particular drug and that particular disease. And so this is useful then because it enables us to see um, the strength of these relationships and, and just how important they, they might be in terms of their, their biological insights. Um, so um, where do we go and get all this data? That's a very important question. Um, and this is a big problem because, well, there's, there's a lot of it that's out there for a start. There's 100 million odd articles, um, particularly if you're, you're counting things like patents, clinical trials, grants, um, all the different ways that we disseminate biomedical research tend to be quite text focused. Uh, and within this text, there's a lot of data that we must curate, um, although it's quite difficult. So we have um, some quite challenging aspects to resolve here. Um, there's all the context, there's the ambiguity of the different names, as you saw from the last slide, the different genes. All of this research is broadly speaking disconnected. It's certainly not built into a semantic web type framework. Most of the data that's there sits unstructured and it's not really properly being um, used by researchers. So in order for us to, to tap into this wealth of data that sits out there within the literature, um, we've got to curate it. Uh, and the way we've done this for many, many years is we've had people read through these publications and put this data into databases. Um, so if you take, um, get, you, you essentially get somebody to read through a document, put all that information into a database, you're looking at about $219 to curate that single article. So if you did ever want to go out there and solve this particular challenge manually, it would be a very, very costly expedition, something in the realm of $22 billion, or at least a very expensive and increasingly timely task that nobody's going to do, uh, and one that would get harder. So scientific research will essentially be continuing to grow. Um, in fact, it, uh, the output doubles every nine years or so. So this, this is a problem that really isn't well suited to, to manual curation. So if we're looking for an automated way to capture, um, difficult to capture data, and I'm talking about the kind of data that search engines might struggle to find, like cause and effect data. Um, we look to things like natural language processing to help us. Um, so there are a number of different challenges that NLP has to resolve to capture a cause and effect relationship, for example. One of the things that it has to do, first of all, uh, in this particular sentence, is to recognize that you've got various different biomedical entities. Um, so you've got a couple of genes here. You've got the androgen receptor, MDM2, um, and prostate stromal cells. So that software might first recognize that, that these are genes and that is a cell. However, that information is probably not that useful unless you normalize it to their respective IDs. Um, if you don't do that, you're, you're missing out on all of the associated metadata all of the associated information on, on genetic sequences or any of the other data that you have structured around these entities. Uh, and for genes, this is a relatively straightforward task. We, we have extremely well curated um, gene databases today. Um, for things like cells and other biomedical concepts, it's not so good. Um, you might look to ontologies to, to map this data to, although they're not complete typically and the, the hierarchies and organization of those concepts within those ontologies um, tends to be um, often quite task specific. So this is actually a challenge in itself, trying to recognize these particular entities to, to concepts. Um, so if we can do that, if we can map this to an ontology and we can map these genes to, to their respective IDs, um, we then want to determine the directionality between these different things. What's the cause and what's the effect? Um, so in this particular example, we can see that MDM2 is the thing that's having an effect on the androgen receptor. So we want to flip these two the other way around. 
And we can also see that the, the state change in either abundance or activity of the androgen receptor is a decreases relationship. Um, this is essentially the degradation of the androgen receptor. Um, and so we want to capture this information at high level if we want to do um, causal inference type analyses where we're looking to see um, what are the state changes that, that occur within these broader knowledge graphs and networks that you might want to analyze. But you still might be interested in the way that this information was actually documented. Um, so the mechanism in this particular relationship is, uh, is ubiquitination. And, and finally, the context in which this experiment or this piece of information is being documented is very important as well. Um, there's a lot of um, kind of negative talk about the, the problem of reproducibility within biomedical research. And if NLP is gonna be useful, we certainly need to capture the context to, to understand um, all of the important information in terms of how this, this particular data was documented. Um, so we wanna capture the fact that this relationship was documented in prostate stromal cells. If we didn't capture that information, it might not be the case that this is this relationship is, uh, is present in other cells and other contexts and that kind of thing. So if software can do all of that, then we might have what's called a true positive. Um, so there's a number of different steps that the software has to do to get um, to that state. Um, so it's a pretty hard challenge. So what we try to do at our company is we uh, essentially assign confidence scores, which are aligned with precision, such that um, if it's 0 0.8, as you can see here, if you took uh, 100 examples, we would expect 80 of them to be correct, um, a proper true positive um, in each of these different tasks. And we'd expect 20 of them to be false positives on average across a, a broad enough data set. So we think confidence scores can be useful because quite often we might want incredibly reliable data. So we would throw out lots of the data that, that perhaps is, uh, is a bit fishy. Um, we might then go for um, lower confidence scores, particularly in projects where there's not much data to, to make sure that we're seeing everything. So we think confidence is a really important thing within NLP, um, particularly when you're dealing with the difficult tasks where you're likely to have false positives. Um, so we've been essentially attacking this problem of curation within text using NLP um, for many years at BioRelate. Um, so we built a platform to try to resolve a number of these different challenges. And the way that we're doing it uh, is essentially taking in many, many different sources of biomedical text, things like journals, patents, clinical trials, um, where we might see useful data, essentially. Um, it's all coming in live on a daily basis. And we set this thing up so that we can um, potentially process uh, internal content as well. Um, we like the fact that we're, we're trying to capture everything out there in the public domain, but particularly the bigger companies, particularly the big pharmaceutical companies, um, they have a lot of data themselves, uh, clinical study reports and that kind of thing. So um, we've set this up to potentially uh, attack the same problem internally as well. So once we get hold of all that text that's coming in through the platform, it essentially runs through a series of software services that we've developed that aim to, to resolve the kind of things that I showed you on the last slide. And then we get a lot of data at the end of that, a massive knowledge graph that we, we use to empower different products and services, which I'm not gonna talk about today. I didn't want this to be a sales pitch. I'm gonna talk more about the science and hopefully give it some, some examples of why this data is, is pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, that brings me to the second part of my talk, how you can actually apply this, this data to, to drug discovery challenges. Um, so first of all, I actually want to, to set the scene a bit here um, in terms of why you might want to, to collect data um, to support drug discovery. It sounds like a silly question, but I think this is a very useful framing. And I've pulled this straight from um, a wonderful publication um, produced by AstraZeneca on what they're calling the five R's and the five R framework. Um, and essentially it amounts to, to conducting various different truth seeking behaviors in order to determine that the particular drug target 
and drug that you're developing, um, sorry, the drug that you're developing, not the drug target, the drug that you're developing is one that is likely to be successful. So if you, you follow through a series of these kind of truth seeking data, hypothesis testing um, behaviors, then you're more likely to, to have a drug that's going to work if it passes all of those, those kind of tests. Um, without doing this, um, as they showed in this particular publication, you're, you're probably going to see some failures in phase two, which are going to be far more costly than um, failing very earlier in the clinical trials. So I think this is a very important aspect of drug discovery, and it just underlines the importance of um, being able to get a proper understanding of the data that's out there, I think. Um, so one of those R's is the, the right target. Um, so what you'd be looking for is essentially a strong link between the target and the disease, differentiated efficacy, available and predicted biomarkers, the right tissue, you might have adequate bioavailability in tissue exposure, definition of pharmacodynamic biomarkers, a clear understanding of preclinical and clinical PKPD, drug to drug interactions. And this list kind of goes on, right safety, right patient, right commercial potential. So if you cover all of these bases, and you've, you've essentially um, done some rigorous understanding of each of these points, then you've probably got a drug that's more likely to be successful further down the line in clinical trials. Um, so I'm going to focus on one aspect of it, which is more to do with the, the link between the target and the disease. And I'm going to start by asking the question, how many known or hypothesized drug targets are there? So if we, we just do a very simple calculation, First of all, uh, in that we're saying that there are 20,000 odd human or 19,000 odd human protein coding genes, which we know about. Um, and then in the, the kind of gold standard ontologies, we've got um, various diseases and phenotypes. And essentially, if you build a matrix of these proteins against diseases, you get 720.7 odd million pairs of proteins and diseases. And we're only talking about single proteins here. Um, there are obviously many different flavors to drug targets, phosphoproteins, complexes, um, not to mention polypharma strategies where you're going for multiple targets. Um, I'm keeping this simple to make this, uh, I guess, a more interesting talk. Um, but even still, that is a lot of potential drug targets that are out there per disease. So, the next question we might ask is how much of these particular pairs are being researched within the literature and beyond? So if we look at all of the, the, the kind of publications that we ingest within our platform, at the, the most basic rudimentary level, such that these proteins and diseases are mentioned together in the same document, we see 21 million pairs or 21 million unique pairs of proteins and diseases. Um, that can be anywhere within the document. Um, we can go more specific. We can see that if we're looking just within sections, there are 16 million, just within sentences, there's about 2.6. And if we look for ones where there's some kind of cause and effect relationship between them, there's around about 300,000. So not, not many about 0.04% of all of those 720 million possible pairs, tiny fraction have actually got, uh, well, what we found to be a cause and effect relationship between them. And of course, that, that's not all of the literature. There are, there are some ones that are missing, but still from what is a sizable amount of data that we process, that is uh, uh, what, what should be seen as a, a small number of, of pairs, I think. So I think that's quite interesting, first of all. Um, but perhaps if we think about getting this number up, um, so I showed you previously that you can link together these different cause and effect relationships to form paths or DAGs, direct cyclic graphs. And um, we can do this um, essentially by saying at depth one, we've got just a cause and effect relationship, which is there's about 290,000. At depth two, um, there's an intermediate step. So we've got the cause or the, the, the drug target um, doing something to something else, which then has an impact on our disease. That's step two. So that actually goes up to about 4.5 4. 
um, target or protein disease pairs. Um, and the debt-free, it goes up to nearly 20 million. So yeah, we can get this number up, which is, I guess, um, pretty useful if you're, you're trying to um, understand particular diseases and particular proteins and their relationships um, that might not already have been um, documented and, and talked about already. Um, so we might be interested to know um, what that looks like. So I've showed you before that you can put these together in these kind of ranked Sankey plots. Um, so here we've got just a randomly picked pair of, of protein and disease. In this case, it's SCN3A and colorectal cancer. Um, and again, you've got these things in the middle, which are, um, um, this is all flowing left to right. Um, everything in the middle is being um, regulated by SCN3A, which supposedly has a, a causal relationship with colorectal cancer. Um, so I actually think these are also interesting from another perspective. Um, if you think that this is all flowing left to right and that these are responsive to target and causal to disease, these make particularly interesting candidates for uh, pharmacodynamic biomarkers um, because essentially they are pathological to the disease if they are causal, as, as they're being shown here, and they are responsive to target. So this would make them very interesting candidates to look at if they're showing up in particular assays um, when, we're, when we're trying to find good PD biomarkers for a disease. Of course, you want to pair this data with the, the kind of tractability type measures of biomarkers. Um, you know, is this thing secreted or is this thing, um, you know, how can we have you actually got an assay to measure it? But from a perspective of just finding what might be, be good to start with, this is a great place to look, a great way to point you to potential hypotheses to go out there and test. Um, but I'm not going to talk too much about PD markers. I'm going to talk more about the, the target uh, disease type stuff. Um, so let's focus again on colorectal cancer. Um, what we're looking at here is um, three different proteins uh, and how they've been documented against colorectal cancer. And I've taken one um, very common example, TP53. It's what you probably call a known known. Um, this has been mentioned many, many times alongside colorectal cancer, um, huge number of documents. Um, also as cause and effect relationship directly. Um, there are many links between these things at DEF2, DEF3, and they, they both have significant enrichment scores um, in that they're below 0.05. Um, so it's obviously um, a significant gene. No surprises there, though. This is what you'd expect. Everybody who's working in the field of cancer and colorectal cancer will know that T53 is an important gene and protein um, in that particular disease. Um, the second one, however, might, might be seen a bit differently. So it's been mentioned alongside colorectal cancer in a much smaller number of documents. There aren't any directed relationships between these two things that we've been able to find from our software, but yet at DEF2 and DEF3, you can see that there are various links between them. Um, and actually they're enriched again, uh, and perhaps more enriched than TP53. So yet this has not been documented as having a cause and effect relationship, but when we put it together in these paths, we start to see that potentially this is actually quite interesting. And we can take this one step further where we can see a particular protein that has never been mentioned with colorectal cancer, zero co-mentions with that particular disease. So definitely no causal mentions this time, but DEF2 and DEF3, again, we have links between these two things and they're significant uh, in terms of their enrichment. So here we have a completely unknown um, pair of, of protein to disease in which we've been able to find that they're potentially significantly related and that could be a very promising novel target for us to look at if we wanted to look at things which no one else is researching and that might um, potentially have some impact against colorectal cancer. So this is a really nice way of, of kind of filtering and finding data that, that you might want to prioritize in experiments. Um, so yeah, we can take this another step further and we can do this systematically across uh, the entire collection of pairs that we, we have at DEF2 and DEF3, uh, measuring both their significance and their novelty. 
So at depth two, we see that there are um, quite a high degree of significant pairs. Um, you perhaps expect this because there are not many steps between these, these two things. Um, so you get a number of significant ones, but you also get a very high number of novel significant pairs. And, and likewise, at depth three, you get this as well. And together, across all of these different 20 million or so um, protein disease pairs, you see that you've got 8.8 .8 odd million significant ones and 4.1 million of those which uh, have never been published together in a document before. Um, so potentially pretty interesting. Um, but that's not to say that all of those are going to um, be, be good drug targets to look at. Um, and I'll, you probably want to pair this with um, tractability measures again. Um, and you probably want to start looking at the, the, the details behind how these things are linked to see if there's anything um, that's more important in terms of context or the biology and, and how these, these two things go together. But it's certainly a good place to look because this is all ranked data. And uh, if you're, you're starting from scratch and you don't want to go off and spend a bunch of money doing some experiments that are poten potentially fishing expeditions, this is the way to, to find the, the more interesting things that are more likely to yield positive results. Um, so we can also take a look at um, what, what are the, the known targets, the things that are already drugs that are out there um, targeting colorectal cancer. So we can use a great database called Kemble to, to find that there are 277 drugs um, out there in the world being used for colorectal cancer. It's actually not all the drugs. There's probably better databases for, for drugs that are proprietary, but this is certainly a great free resource for, for looking at this type of data. So across colorectal carcinoma, colorectal cancer, or colorectal adenocarcinoma, and there are 277 odd drugs, which target 121 single proteins. And that's the, the main protein within the mechanism of, of those, those drugs. So actually quite a broad range of targets for, for a disease. Um, and if we look at those particular proteins against the, the data that we've collected at BioRelate, um, we know that 66% of the proteins in our data for colorectal cancer are um, significant in that they're enriched. And there's 100% of the known targets which are significant are debt free. So all of, those, the, all of those existing known drug targets that are out there are significant within our data set. So that's a good, good test to see that we were representing what is potentially the known biology. And so we can look at this at um, essentially DEF1, the causal mentions, 106, but then by DEF2 and DEF3, there's 120 and then 121 of these um, known targets represented. So this is kind of neat. We're capturing a lot of what we call the known knowns um, in, in these, these types of analyses. And then finally, we might be interested in, in sort of filtering this down into um, things that, as I say, that are more tractable things that are going to be uh, more likely to yield a good result when you, you start to investigate this in the lab. Um, so if we take those 4 million novel significant protein disease pairs, there are about 11.6 thousand unique proteins. Uh, again, another fantastic resource um, freely available is Open Targets. And so here we're linking the Open Targets data set to um, these proteins. Uh, and you can see that across every measure of tractability, 93% of those are, are tractable, um, although a high percentage of that is our protax, which um, are perhaps not the best tractability measure, but they are one measure of tractability. Um, still a high degree of a small molecule and antibody, which are obviously very popular ways to develop drugs. So again, this, this is just a very nice way um, of being able to, to home in and find potentially good drug targets. Um, so hopefully I've given you a very short appreciation of the power of causal reasoning and why you can potentially use it to understand drugs. There's obviously a lot more I could have shown you here, but this, uh, this was meant to be an intro to the field and hopefully there's a lot of people here that are now um, a bit more educated and might have some interesting questions. Um, the problem is that the most of this scientific knowledge is generally inaccessible to systems analysis. So we as a company are trying to enable this. We're trying to get more of this data into the hands of the people that are developing some very, very important drugs um, through the, the power of our platform, Galactic AI. And 
Right, hopefully I've showed you that by connecting together these different articles, we can reveal what I like to call unknown unknowns and um, that drug discovery can be empowered by these hypotheses to potentially make better decisions. And um, on that, that's me finished. Um, but just a quick um, plug here for the company and what we're doing. Um, if you want to follow us, you can go on LinkedIn um, and follow us there or, or Twitter. Um, we're currently recruiting for at least one position and we've, we've got some internships um, being lined up for the summer as well. Um, but there will soon to be a lot more recruitment coming a bit later in the year, following some positive news I'll be hopefully announcing in a month or so. Um, start a conversation with us, email us, go on our website or potentially um, sign up for our tool and have a play and browse some of the data that we, we curate. Um, so, yeah, I can now take some questions. I'll probably pass back to Charlie at this space. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, so I, ha I have one question to kick off, which is sort of about the, the depth um, analysis. And so at the start, you have your, you know, your causal link that you find from the literature. And then you're trying to extend this and say, you know, can we do successive depths? But my question is, if you have your, your first um, variable that you find, it has a causal impact on the next one. And then that one has a causal impact on your actual target. Mm -hmm. Does that not introduce um, the possibility that your first variable actually will affect lots of other different things and they may have knock-on effects on your target? Is that in, sort of included in your system, the possibility for that sort of confounding, those sort of extra links that may be going on? Yeah, sure. So the way I've treated this is, is very much um, the way I've tried to try to um, demonstrate this is through the perspective of independent paths um, but okay. you're absolutely right that there is a lot of complexity to to the underlying biology um, and particularly when you consider kind of positive feedback loops and, and that kind of thing that this this can get um, yeah pretty complex pretty pretty quickly um, fortunately when you get to the um, the kind of major the, the full connected graphs where you're looking at um, the overall relationship across all the different paths, it does factor in those, um, those um, variables and those instances. Uh, I think for my talk, I've just tried to keep it as simple as possible by showing you the, the independent ways, but you're absolutely right. There's a hell of a lot of complexity. And also, if you consider that each of those individual relationships that are documented will potentially have its own unique context, so yes. you, may, you may need to filter out some of the data. Um, you may need to build more, more functional representations of it. Um, but this, this has all been done on you know, one plain context. Um, it's really just to illustrate, I think, just you know, how, how much data that there is to start with and then potentially what you can do with it once you find it. Um, so yeah, hopefully that, that answers that one. Yeah, um, and then another one which which links to Mark's question in the Q and A, which is sort of um, a question about quality of studies and also about the language that's used in these studies. So, as I understand it, you're looking at the the language in the studies. That's going to help you decide whether something is causally linked. Mm -hmm. However, you know, for, for epidemiological studies or whatever, someone may establish a correlation, and then um, you know make a comment like. This shows that X is strongly associated with or leads to Y. Mm. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering, do you have filters in place to extract good studies where they've really done randomized control trials or they've, they've made better, better efforts to ensure there's a causal link when they're using their language? Um, or is that something you kind of have to deal with in, in another way? Yeah, I think there's a few ways to answer this question. Um, so... Um, the first is the very, the very kind of speculative data we, we, don't, we don't capture. So where somebody says, like, we hypothesized that this particular yeah. thing, that, that, that's, that's ruled out immediately. Um, but then from there, um, at the very top level, we, we essentially have four relationships, which are increases, decreases, regulates, where there's an ambiguous relationship being talked about, or causes no change, which um, is negative data. Um, so we, we keep it simple in order to make the, um, the, these kind of causal reasoning analyses work. But then, um, as you say, there's different quality of studies that are out there. Uh, so the next thing is that each of, the, each of the cause and effect relationships that we capture 
is, is directly tied to source. So we have all of the context from that source captured, as well as all of the information about what that source is. So if we wanted to, to re remove and, and isolate you know, the highest quality, um, what, what quality from the perspective of study data, we would remove everything that, that wasn't that. And then you're left with anything that's data that's found within that particular research. Now I showed you an example on the slide where the property of the decreases relationship was ubiquitination. Um, so we, we call that a relationship property um, because essentially we're using what's called a property graph model. So with property graph models, you can add in any properties that you want to the entities and the relationship um, to capture any of that additional context in which the relationship is documented. So if somebody was talking about overexpression or somebody's talking about knockdown or somebody's talking about um, you know, the, the, the specifics of how that particular cause and effect relationship was captured, we also capture that as properties of the cause and effect relationship too. So with all of that information, what you're left with is essentially ways to, to filter out things. Um, so, so yeah, it's all there. We're, we're essentially just trying to give people all of the info and let them figure out what they, they want to keep and ditch and, and yeah, what they want to retain. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I think I think the wording in lots of publications is, you know, it can be ambiguous sometimes. Um, and so on that sort of Sanjay has a question about the sort of overall publications that you collect and so forth. So you're drawing from many sources, but I'm sure lots is from academic publications. Mm. So is this taken just from open access publications or do you manage to take data from from, you know, paid for publications as well? Yeah, so this is this is a thing that we hate about um, obviously the world of research that you've only got access to a small percentage of of potentially all of the published research that's out there. So we, we do have to just use the, the open access publications that are there um, for for kind of the default tool. But we do have ways of processing closed access research, particularly if we're dealing with companies that, that have already bought it. <laughs> um, we're talking to, sorry, we're talking to publishers potentially about um, slightly different relationships to get our, our um, their data into our platform um, in that capacity. But yeah, this is a problem for research. Uh, hopefully, it's one that's got a lot better in the last five years with everybody pushing to publish in open access. But um, but yeah, we, we're we're restricted in the same way that everybody else is restricted. We yeah. can only process what we can get our hands on. Um, some of it's easier, PubMed, PubMed Central, there's, there's generally nice repositories to just pick up the XMLs and process it. Other stuff's far more difficult. You have to develop um, ingest services to capture all the weird ways that people publish their documents. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it's, some of it is, is not just the challenge of, of are you legally allowed to process it, it's can you actually get it into a format in the platform to start with. Um, but yeah, uh, no closed access. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah, it, it does sound like a tricky problem. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there, but I just wanted to, to as a last thing, say I really loved your correlation plot of temperature and pirates. My favourite <laughs> one of those is uh, Nicolas Cage films and shark attacks in Australia, which has an incredible correlation. Um, so uh, thank you very much again, Dan, and thank you, Neil. Um, our next session will be in around 10 minutes at 3.30, where we have the start of our panel discussions. We've got a panel on startups and a panel on um, scientific frontiers. Uh, and so we will look forward to seeing you there. You all should have access to the Zoom links. Okay, great. Thank you. Record.